inside the minds of top competitive shooters, firearms instructors, gear and gun manufacturers, journalists, and other people on the cutting edge of the firearms nation. Join us and get answers to the questions you want to know. And now, here's your host, Arik Levy. And welcome back to another episode of the Firearms Nation podcast. We are back from SHOT Show, which always is exciting. If you haven't had a chance to go, I always recommend finding a way. And if you can't make it to SHOT, well, there's always NRA Show, which is open to people who are members of the NRA, people who care about guns. And that's you, the Firearms Nation. But I digress. Today, I am talking with Mike Foley, and it's always been one of those things where we have the State of the Union from our President of the United States. Well, I think we should have a State of the Union of USPSA, which is United States Practical Shooting Association. I am a member, and I know there are a lot of you who are members. If you are in competition, if you're in handgun competition in the United States, well, you've got IDPA and you've got USPSA. USPSA is currently made up of approximately 30,000 members, and that is nothing to scoff at. That's a lot of people who are into shooting. And USPSA is run by the president, Mike Foley. And last year, I had Mike as one of the first podcasts that I ever did. I saw him at SHOT Show. We sat down. We had an interesting discussion on the topics that are affecting the members of USPSA. And this year, I tried to do the same. Where have we come from and where are we going? And there are some serious issues facing the membership this year in USPSA, and I addressed them with Mike. Uh, he was very gracious with me to sit down and talk about these problems. Well, they're not really problems. These are issues because they're going to be fixed one way or another, and they're going to be addressed. I've been following the saga with production, with single stack nationals, with the unified nationals, if that's what you want to call them. These are things that are probably in the forefront of the interwebs right now at the matches, what people are talking about. So without further ado, I'd rather you hear it directly from our president, Mike Foley. Right. So the first year, we, you have your, your dreams and you see the realities. The second year is generally looked at in a term that is actually now officially yours. All right. And then as you move forward, it's all what's going on with Mike Foley. And then now you can't go back and say, listen, this is, this is stuff from the other. No, this is now you. Right. We, we, we have a lot of momentum with the things we're doing. We still face some challenges, um, whether they're inherited or, or just ongoing. And we're, um, we're gaining a lot of momentum. So. So personally for your expectations, is this what you thought it would be? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of those memes uh, that are the four panel meme, what your mother thinks you do, what the members right. think you do, what you actually do. Right. Um, I, w I will tell you that I never dreamed I would spend so much time sitting in rooms with lawyers and accountants, which is a part of the job. Uh, I never dreamed that I would be dumping the um, employee bucket out to the ex extent that we are operating with five less people than before, but but 10 self-starters. Uh, I never realized... Um, how much um, the affiliates, um, while they need support, are, are often operating uh, on things that are independent of our mission. Uh, so th there, were some, there were some things that I hadn't thought through completely 
Um, I just wanted to get in here and get to it. And so we got in here and got to it. And, and so was it what I expected? In some ways, yes. And in, in other ways, not so much. How much has the membership gone up since you took office? Uh, when I started, we had 24,000 members, 24,858, I believe. Um, last count that I received, we were at about 30,500. Uh, I was given a statistic yesterday that we had taken in 677 new members in January alone. We always take in some members uh, and have attrition with some members, but our retention rate is also much higher than it was before. So not only are we growing, but we're keeping those people. Uh, that's also measured in the um, conversion of annual to three-year to five-year to life memberships. Our life membership conversion rate's higher than it's ever been. Why do you think that is? I think it shows confidence in the organization. Uh, I'm the first guy in a lot of years to get to do this job full time. Uh, I have uh, four really astute vertical managers who handle our media and events, uh, who handle our IT, uh, who handle our uh, uh, finance and operations, and of course, NROI. And uh, because of, of, of that structure, uh, we're, able to, um, we're able to work in a way that just wasn't possible before. So the world shoot is over, and that was, I think we were talking about it last year, you know, that was pending, and you were concerned there were some issues with the, the world organization for uh, IPSC and the contingent in the Philippines that, well, we had two issues going. We had the contingent with the Philippines, and for people who aren't up on that, uh, this is a group that well, wanted to be part of the USPSA, even though they're not in the United States. Correct. And if you understand USPSA, <laughs> the first two letters are United States. Wow, I never thought of that. Never thought of that. <laughs> well, you know, for the people who are uh, just waking up in the morning, driving to work, I just wanted to confirm that with them. Absolutely. Uh, but then you also had the concern with our shooters from our country coming into France and not being able to shoot, their guns being confiscated, or possibly worse. I mean, there was always that conspiracy theory that they were going to be arrested and whatnot. Uh, none of that happened. Right. So that was good. That was a positive. And also the administration in IPSC has changed. Absolutely. Uh, hopefully for a more positive. I've heard good things about this guy, and uh, I, I hope that he works well with USPSA. But the other issue, though, is the Philippines. Now, what happened with them? So these, this is a group of uh, clubs that wanted to be members of USPSA, even though they weren't part of the U.S. Why, why did they want to become part of the U.S.? Well, let, let, me, let me give a little bit of background on this. Uh, USPSA has always had foreign affiliations. Um, we've had as many as 14 or 15 at one time. Um, currently, uh, we have five foreign affiliates. Um, one of those affiliates is the Philippines. Uh, there's one in Jamaica. There's one in Puerto Rico. Uh, there are a, a few in Canada. Uh, Canada generally has between two and three based on who's running matches what year. Those affiliates um, are just like U.S. affiliates with, with minor exceptions. Uh, one of the exceptions is that to become a foreign affiliate, you have to have your IPSC regional director endorse your membership. And all of those had that endorsement. They also have to have 10 USPSA members with valid numbers who are going to shoot matches in their country. Um, so those requirements, uh, as well as the affiliation agreement, uh, has been in, in, intact in all of the current FCAs and all of them since, since the beginning of time. Um, we had a, a situation in the Philippines where the uh, former regional director uh, and the um, uh, operator of a competing organization um, that was uh, based. So let's talk about confederation versus association. Um, confederations uh, tend to have member regions that are that are literally geographic and they generally have a regional director who is for lack of a better term the boss of all things practical shooting uh, i'm different in that regard because in the united states we have a free market system where there are plenty of event-based things like multi-gun which is under several umbrellas um, pro-am shooting uh, idpa so uh, i'm not this practical shooting czar for the entire united states just the uspsa and steel challenge and everything that falls under that uh, but my counterparts uh, in countries that are often much smaller than individual states in our country 
are the czar of all things practical shooting. And those organizations have uh, ministries of sport, which we don't have here. And they're somewhat funded uh, in some cases by their own governments and by very expensive and exclusive members, member or membership. In some cases, not with that many members. So the, so the structure is dramatically different. So the um, IPSC region in the Philippines was producing a few events. And this other organization wanted to start producing more events, more opportunities for people to shoot. The two of the, the two gentlemen at the head of those organizations uh, had a philosophical dispute, which turned into a much larger dispute uh, where leverage was applied to IPSC and USPSA and what was once harmonious um, was not harmonious. Uh, I contended that that non-harmonious situation was not our problem, and you and I talked about that a year ago. Uh, and I and I, and I continued to uh, try to get both of those gentlemen to to, to reach an agreement. Continued to work with the IPSC Executive Council um, and made the membership aware that we had some some tough decisions to make. Um, should we end up in the worst of of all situations? Uh, here last year, I met a lot of our, our counterparts from Europe and worked with them and um, stayed in touch with them. Uh, under no circumstances were our friends around the world going to let the U.S. be kicked out of the world shoot. So that that fear, you know, got to be less and less as we headed into the world shoot. Uh, I went to the IPSC General Assembly. Uh, addressed the assembly. Um, met a lot more people. Did a lot more networking. Um, and we elected new leadership for IPSC. And that uh, new leadership starts with the IPSC president, Vitaly Kryuchin, who, rather than being an administrator for the last 20 years, is one of us. He pulls the trigger. Uh, he started his own region in, in Russia, where he was the former regional director. And that region had four members, and they now have 36,000. They're larger than us. Now, that's a little bit skewed in that in a lot of those countries, they don't have the same uh, rights and privileges that we do where we wake up every day and we have firearms ownership. You and I can wake up every day and buy five guns if we want and then find something to do with them. There, they have to have a, a legitimate sporting purpose to own them, and it's very controlled and, and, and very specific. And so their rights are contingent upon the legitimacy of the sport. They also don't have you know the, the, the competition there. None of the other countries, um, uh, with the exception of, you know, the Philippines is a good example where individual firearms ownership is a thing. They have the same similar system that we do, even though they do shut their firearms privileges down for a few days, uh, they're basically able to have their guns and move about freely with them. And some of the other countries are, are able to do that. But for the most part, IPSC is made up of regions who don't have that access. And because of that, I want to be real sensitive that, that nothing that we do endangers their firearms rights. While I wake up every day, my job is to take care of us here in the United States and to make sure that we have access to those events. Uh, I just want to be sensitive not to step on them, um, and yet still maintain our own identity as Americans. So uh, the new leadership at IPSC uh, not only co comes with a president, but it comes with a, a new treasurer, a new secretary general, uh, a new secretary, uh, which is the administrative manager for IPSC, if you will. And those gentlemen are also now friends and acquaintances and people that, that, that we can work with. Just yesterday, I met with the uh, IPSC execs, and President Vitaly Krajicin is putting a council together of regional directors from each continent. It's going to be a brand new eight-person leadership council for IPSC, and he has tapped me out to be uh, on that council from North America. So I would represent everything from Panama to Canada. Um, that's uh, very exciting for me because it means that the United States, rather than being excluded and chastised, has a chastised has a seat at the table. So um, the other thing is, I've been asked to either head or appoint uh, someone from the United States to be the head of the Rules Committee for an expansion area for IPSC. They're going to enter into pistol caliber carbine. They're going to enter into multi gun which is a replacement for them in some cases from not necessarily just three gun, but they will probably have a lot of countries that can say run only a pistol and rifle or only a rifle and shotgun or only a pistol and shotgun. And so uh, multi-gun. And then the third thing is uh, production optics. Uh, one of the directives that I was given yesterday uh, when I accepted both of those posts was not to deliver something that looks more like IPSC, 
but to simply deliver what our success stories are in those lanes so that the, the, the rest of the world can uh, get that same start. And so we may not always be um, the same since we have our own rule book. We may not always be aligned with IPSC in every handgun division, uh, although they're very similar. Um, in those lanes, they're willing to accept our version of what's already going on. And so because of that, PCC will likely be as we shoot it here in the States with only restrictions in places where their equipment is restricted by their government. Do you think that we're down the path where both sides of the house are going to be equal in terms of what the rules are, and then eventually it's just going to be IPSC? I don't, I don't foresee that being the, the direction, but rather a more cohesive um, a situation where we offer more access to IPSC events, we offer more of our own IPSC events, and we offer as much commonality as we can without giving up our core identities. Uh, as I talked with our members over the last two years, while there are some people who would, for instance, do away with the metric target or some people who would, would align 100% with IPSC rules, the majority of our members don't want that. They want to keep the target selections that we have. They want to keep um, the equipment divisions that we have. In some cases, they may think we have too many or too few. Uh, I will tell you right now, we do not have too few. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. I can't think of anything that doesn't fit into one of our eight sports divisions. But so the the the, the third uh, the third thing that we're working with with IPSC is an international safe shooter uh, instructor cadre uh, to try to make. Um, um, safe shooters from um, multiple countries have an easier access to, in, to to events and to show up there safer uh, than if we just pull them straight out of their house and put them into a match. So like a pre-vetting that... Well, you're... It, it, it would simply be a, a, a safety course. I think a lot of countries will require it. Uh, it will be the last uh, thing that Americans will want to do is require a two-day class to shoot a match, and it's not really what our um, our, our mission and, and our, uh, if you read our bylaws and you read the preface and if you read um, the rule book, we're supposed to offer safe, fun, fi safe, fun fair, practical shooting to uh, people uh, uh, who are reputable. It doesn't say people who are trained or, or so forth. It doesn't mean we can't require some safety, but it's going to have to be available in such a way at each event that we don't turn people away from practical shooting. Because practical shooting is very safe. One-on-one -on -one, uh, engagement between a range officer and a competitor, um, a, a very firm rule book uh, to the point that, you know, no matter who you are, if you break the rules in, in an unsafe way, we have disqualification for that. And so um, I can't foresee us ever requiring that, especially at a level one match, but perhaps we could participate in that program such that we could uh, accept international shooters who are already qualified, send shooters internationally who are already qualified, have an instructor here in the United States that could also promote and, and through NROI offer safe shooter classes regionally uh, for people who want to take it and maybe even integrate something into uh, level one matches such that there's at least a small primer of these are the things you can do and the things you can't. The good news for me is those are things that level one matches already do. They just don't have an organized way of doing them. Uh, the first time I went to a USPSA match, there were, there were a couple of gentlemen there who talked us through what all of the, the range commands were, had us draw our guns, had us fire shots while moving, just kind of to demonstrate that we were safe enough to proceed didn't mean that we didn't have things to learn. It just meant that, that, that we were doing it. Um, so that's one of the things that, that, that they also have in mind. And, and the fourth thing would be to offer more IPSC events. And one of the things that, that, that I would like to see us do is offer um, more um, single gun, uh, long gun, like shotgun or rifle matches, which fit well within our rule book, both on the uh, multi-gun side uh, because you can run multi-gun for a single gun. You can run it for two guns, three guns, even four guns uh, under the current rules. And if you do multi-gun matches under the multi-gun, if you do single guns under the multi-gun rules, you can choose between time plus or hit factor scoring. So it gives match directors everything they need to be able to run the match the way they want to run it. And competitors, the, the, the ability to practice for both IPSC events and also shoot USPSA events. Do you think that we're getting too big in terms of all the divisions we have? Now we're starting to bring in some IPSC. We have Steel Challenge. I mean, it's becoming this giant squid or octopus of all these different little things. 
Uh, do you think that it's just going to become, it's going to keep going, going, it's going to become unmanageable, and then people are just going to get lost in what they're going to be doing? Like, where are we? What is this? In, in fact, I think just the opposite. Uh, the more people pulling the trigger, the better, obviously. Um, one of the things that, that I've done with our, even with our branding is, is I've tried to move away from being recognized out there as all these brands. In the United States, I want the big brand to be USPSA and almost an equally as large brand to be Steel Challenge. Steel Challenge is its own sport now. It has 10,000 new classifications in 2017 alone, 11 new level two and three matches for Steel Challenge. That's that's really becoming its own thing so much, in, in fact, that we're putting uh, a tremendous amount of energy there. Those are our two main focuses. All of these other things um, are complementary things that we may offer them, but we're going to offer them in small doses. And, and, and IPSC is a good, a good example of that. Our, about 60 to 100 of our athletes every third year are going to go somewhere and compete. We're sending 36 people to the World Shotgun Shooting Championship this year, as an example. So what I want to do is make sure that those, those folks have a way to get what they need to be able to go to that event. It doesn't mean that we're going to spend our days and our weeks and our months on those programs, but they're still a small part of who we are. Uh, the same thing uh, with handgun world shoots. Uh, you know, we've been doing that 18 times now over the past 40 years, and we're going to continue to do that. Are we going to put a tremendous amount of our administrative push and our resource into the IPSC brand? Not any more than our seat at the table. And I have 105 counterparts as regional directors there. So if I'm one of 105 there and I'm one of one here, what's going to get the most of my attention? What we're doing here. So um, multi-gun is, is a place where USPSA traditionally has uh, had an opportunity but not been at the apex of the opportunity. And the free, free market system that we have here in the United States for shooting sports organizations has caused multi-gun's identity, identity to literally be, we're not organized. That's how they're organized, by not being organized. And so um, also a very small focus for us. We have a nationals each year. Uh, I would encourage an area match in, 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 in each arena. But the same structure is not ever going to filter down to level one matches being organized in multi-gun the way they are in USPSA. So that's a small piece of who we are. So for me, it's more of an allocation of those things. Rather than spend all of our time talking about the small ones, we're going to do the small ones, but we're going to focus most of our energy on the large ones. So this year, this coming year, 2018, there's several things that have gotten people, and there's always going to be your issues. Like I said, last year it was the world shoot. This year we got some things that people are talking about. And one of the things that they're talking about is the potential change to production. Absolutely. Uh, does it need to be changed? Let's, let's talk about production. And the, the, the main question that I get, and I've had that, those questions here to show is, What's going on with production? And I generally have some sort of shock response like, oh, we're going to shred it. We're going to nuke it. There won't be any more production. And then when their jaw comes back up off the floor, I, I explain to them that no one is looking to change the core identity of production. All of our divisions have a core identity. Open has compensators, 170 millimeter magazines, red dot sights. Limited has a somewhat lesser capacity, iron sights, revolver, single stack, PCC, carry optics, those pretty well have their own identity just based on saying the division's name. Production division's identity could be characterized as guns with really bad first trigger pulls, but that's not really what production's identity is. Production's identity is guns that are readily produced from major manufacturers uh, in 2,000 or more to get approved to be on our list. So we have a list. They fit a box. And that box should be closed when they fit it. So they fit, you know, a, com a, com a completely wholly within the box. Uh, it's a 10-round division and has been since its inception. There are some arguments, and there always have been since day one, about what production's capacity should be. That's actually not a part of the proposed discussion that we're going to have at the board meeting, but I think based on member feedback, it will be a part of the discussion. Um, production also has uh, a weight limit, plus or minus two ounces, on based on the list. Okay, I don't want to change any of those things that we just talked about. I don't want to change production's identity. What I do want to do and what the board would like to do and what would best help our new shooters, our experienced shooters who switch divisions and our volunteers is if we stopped obsessing over small parts. So in my opinion, 
a nice happy medium would be to leave production exactly as it is with the with the exception of hammers triggers thumb safety small bolt on parts we don't want to make it another limited division we don't want to make it anything that it's not uh, but but the amount of guns that we saw this week for the first time that we didn't know existed, including frame changes without model number changes and so forth, are too cumbersome for even our czars to keep up with, much less our volunteers at 450 affiliates and competitors who often have these modified guns before they ever find out about us on YouTube or Shooting USA or on your podcast. And so if they... If they come to us with an already production illegal gun based on something that is literally an appearance related item, I think that that's bad for business. So nobody wants to change production at its core, but I would like to stop arguing over parts because the argument itself is becoming a detraction from the division. So what do you think the core of production is? I mean, from, from my perspective, it is the closest thing to picking, going to the gun store, buying a stock gun, and then going to the range and shooting. Right. And that, there's an appeal to that. For, for the people who are not into the race of, like you say, for the, all those little small parts, to, to get the little extra weight here, the, the, the guide rod, the, all these little things just to, to make it more competitive. Because I see what happens is that the people who go and buy that stock gun and they want to get better, and there's nothing better than competition to get better. But now that they're, they're getting their ego crushed because they're going against someone else in production who has a gun that is pretty close to a limited gun. I would, I, would, I would offer that in this day and time, with people showing up with guns that are already not stock, that we crush them by moving them to open as soon as they get there or moving them to limited if we catch them before they fire the first shot. Uh, it's, it's, it's my opinion that stock is unenforceable. Uh, stock is unenforceable even in IPSC, though when you go to the world shoot, they have a, a pit crew of people there who are there looking and scrutinizing guns, looking for a way to kick, kick those guns out of the competition. And if they kick them out, it's on the competitors to say that they're legal. If you walk around a shot show floor or if you just look at guns that our members are buying, they're buying Tanfo Stock 2s. They're buying CZ Shadow 2s. Uh, they're buying... Um, uh, what's what, what they're they're buying the the Sig three twenty X five they're buying the, the Sig three twenty VTAC they're buying guns that are already produced with those modifications inside that make them more competitive. Okay, so that stuff exists and those models change so dramatically. And you know what, manufacturers don't contact us; they don't reach out to us. And when production started, there were literally only two or three guns that were that were really, you know, stakeholders in production division. Today, every manufacturer that has a production gun has five variants of it. Uh, we just don't have the bandwidth and the ability to, to push it out to all the volunteers to know which parts are which. And I've, one of the arguments I've heard is that, well, I know what all of those parts are, so ROs should, should care enough to know what those, those parts are. ROs are just like everyone else. What do you compete with? What pistol do you use? The 320. Okay, so you have a SIG 320. Unless you have also been a Glock enthusiast, a CZ enthusiast, a Grand Glock. Power enthusiast. I shot a Tanfo and a CZ. I shot them all, right. right. So. But, do you, but do you have any idea at any given point who was providing parts to the, to the factory? No. What features were on what guns? Whether model numbers changed when features changed or not? I know, what, I know what I need to do to make it better, but... And what to look for, but again, your point is well taken. That that's that's an enthusiastic person, where someone who wants to be an RO doesn't also want to be an armor on all these different platforms and study the forums and talk to everybody else. He just wants to know what the rules are and how to enforce it. Uh, so, how can we keep production at its core and still be able to enforce a certain? Standard, like, could could there be like three things? Like, you know, we we measure trigger pull, like they do in Ipsic. Your your pull has to be this, uh, and I, you don't adjust. You know, you know, you don't mill the slide. Uh, things, but yeah, I know. But guys are making guns now, making two thousand guns with slide serrations, so they have an advantage there. I mean, there's got to be a way that we can do it without taking production apart and making it into limited minor. There is, and IPSC has the same problem. But because they're not an association with members, 
they're they're just member regions. This problem doesn't get amplified in social media the way it does in, in, in ours. Yesterday, they were discussing with us the validity of the three pound pull weight and what where certain guns fell. The IPSC leadership for the entire world sat in that meeting and they were not aware of all the different guns and all the different triggers. We literally had six people sitting at the table and all of us are heavily invested in equipment for production division. I mean, I have I have more production guns, even though I'm not known as a production shooter. I have production guns from nearly every manufacturer. And we were sitting there d- d- discussing this. So, so the world has the same problem. It's not that there's a better system. How do we protect production division? In my opinion, we protect it with the, the list that we currently have. Gun has to be on the list. To be on the list, you have to follow that protocol. It's not hard. Uh, any legitimately produced factory gun in any quantity can make 2,000 of those, and, and we can look at it and make sure that it's double action, single action, or striker fired. Thing two, it has to still fit the box. Thing three, and that includes with an empty magazine. Thing three is it has to be plus or minus two ounces of the weight with the empty magazine. So all of those things protect that identity. Uh, Another thing would be that we not allow any modification to the grip outside of the currently allowed area. That we not allow any milling of the slide other than to accept, excuse me, sights. And so we keep those things pretty core. Uh, we don't allow any porting. We don't allow any mag wells. Uh, we don't allow any of the things that, that you see in open, for example, uh, or that you see in, in, in limited in the way of thumb rest and those kinds of things. So we keep the approved models core to the division, but that we literally stop obsessing over things that don't change the competition. And my speculation is if we simply said there will be no more hammers, triggers, uh, slide stops, um, any of those discussions, that production's identity would not change. The people who are winning production will still win production. The people who are enjoying production will still enjoy it and will stop arguing and people will stop showing up with equipment and being moved around because of it. Um, and, and I think that that's probably the best compromise for the division from where we sit. There's an additional argument that if you allowed cuts on the slide or modification to the grips that you would allow guns like Zev, Agency Arms, Salient, Terran Tactical, those folks to compete and a lot of people in their living rooms buy the best before they come to come to us. But that's not even where this discussion's going. I think that we're still a little more conservative than that in production division. And so I, I literally think that to not obsess over small parts, but to keep all of the other core elements of the division intact are the easiest enforceable, easiest explainable, and, and best compromise for everyone from a six-time national champion all the way down to a guy who started yesterday. So this argument with, with the, the production, how do you, how do you what, what are you going to be presenting? I'm going to present all arguments, which is what I'm known for. When I go into the room, the, the, the board of directors will, will, will have a presentation with information uh, as to what's being talked about in social media, uh, as to what's being talked about directly with them from the membership, directly with me from the membership. Uh, we will have some photographs uh, up, up on uh, the screen that will uh, show them what some of these things actually mean because, let's face it, there are people on my board who are open shooters, and they've been shooting open for the entire time. Or when they did shoot production, it was Glock 34s and CZ 75s, and there were no specialty guns. Okay, so the Glock 34 actually was a specialty gun when I started. It was like the new hotness for production. So this has been going on a long time. Um, I'll present to them um, everything from don't change anything, it's fine, all the way to make it a full race division. Okay, and the reason that, that that I do that is we get that information from from the membership. And if you read any of the things that are on Facebook or the various forums, you'll see that it doesn't take ten minutes before the discussion is split into about six different heavy opinions. And so the fact that we have this problem is further illustrated by everywhere they're discussing this problem. So, in, in my opinion. Presenting those extremes won't be the, the core of the presentation, but presenting options like change nothing, change to the core things that we just talked about, or change to the core things we just talked about and allow other modifications. Every time we talk about an allowed modification, we have to think about unintended consequences. And I think that if, if, if we simply keep slides and frames 
and barrel profiles as they are and the weight in the box and all those things. And so I already see the conversation shaping up that way. But what will I present? I'll present everything. I'll present every opinion I've been given. My opinion doesn't really matter a great deal. Uh, I'm just uh, afforded the luxury of having all of the information and not being stuck with any one particular direction. I mean, I'm not a dictator in this situation by any stretch of the imagination. Nine people who are elected by the membership will make this decision. And those nine people will get the best information from me and my team that we can offer them. And it even includes people who I may have argued with just to get their perspective. Sure. Do you think a new division could come out of this? No, I don't. I really don't. I've, I've heard all those arguments for longer than I care to admit. Oh, we should have a striker fire division. We should have a single action, uh, double action, single action only division. Uh, those guns belong in limited. Those guns belong here. Those guns belong there. Those are people putting their own personal view. And sometimes it's uneducated, if you will. They simply don't know what they're talking about. And if, if you look at the nationals, um, I think 17% um, of the guns used last year were, were CZ guns, if, if, if I recall. Um, and if, if you look at uh, the, the champions over the last six years, uh, Ben Steger and uh, Alex Goot, they both shot TANFOs. But if, if you uh, look at the number two person, it's generally been Bob Vogel with a Glock. Right. Uh, it's generally been Shane Coley with a Glock. Nils. So Nils Johnson with a Glock. And so my argument for that is, is that at the top, it doesn't matter. And at the bottom, it doesn't matter. Let's cut the confusion out in the middle. Okay. Um, other issues that are been brought up are uh, nationals. So, I th- how's that an issue? Nationals is a great thing. Uh, nationals is a great thing. <laughs> depends on what you're shooting, and depends on uh, where you live, and some other things. I mean, listen. Even in my perspective, I know you can't please everybody. You're going to have to make a decision somewhere down the line and you're just going to have to go with it. And the people who didn't agree with that decision are never going to come around to it. And I, and I faced that myself. What was the rationale to make nationals just one long week, essentially nine days of everything in one location? There, there are, there are several good reasons for it. And I understand that it presents some challenges, and that wasn't lost on me before we we made the decision. Um, First off, national championships are often not determined by where I would like to have them, where the members would like to have them. Uh, They're literally determined by who has a range that will support the nationals and what weekends the hotels have available based on other larger sports and other larger holiday events and and the vacation season and those kinds of things. So there are a handful of places that can support a 20-stage nationals, and they seem to get fewer and fewer. Often the um, administrative challenge is uh, in finding a host facility is making sure that we have everything on the ground that we need to put a match on. You know, I don't have a Nationals kit and a Connex, and if I did, it would get antiquated and worn out and old and irrelevant quickly. Uh, We're not funded like NASCAR, as an example. So what I have to have when we select a location is I have to have a place where they put practical shooting matches on regularly. That gives me two things. That gives me props and support and real estate and restrooms and all the things that we have to have, but it also gives me a core of local volunteers who can plug into our paid volunteer program for the ROs for that event. Uh, It also gives me some help with setup crews, uh, and, and it gives me a place where I don't have to show up to put the match on a week ahead of time, and we do that. We show up a week ahead of time, even with these partners, but have nothing on the ground and have it all have to materialize. So, so for us, a place that, that, that has a practical shooting program is very important. Universal Shooting Academy is a place that fits that very definition. There are several others. Um, the, the, the challenge with um, finding a date is there are 52 weeks in a year. We talked about that last year. Yeah. And in those 52 weeks, when I consider where I put an event, I not only have to look at USPSA and all of its larger area matches and all of its state matches 
and I have to look at IPSC events that our members might be going to, like World Shoot. I have to look at multi, large multi-gun events. I have to look at Pro-Am shooting. I have to look at IDPA. I have to look at everyone, everyone's, uh, everyone else's schedule. And we try to work together as much as possible. Uh, Robert Ray at IDPA contacts me every year and says, we're going to be in September. When are you going to be? Or he calls and says, what are you thinking? And I'll say October. And he'll say, oh, that's bad. I was thinking, you know, we try to do that. And even with that, we stepped on one another this past year. Uh, we worked out a way for top competitors to be able to shoot both matches. It was a little less than ideal, uh, but it worked out. And I think we only had about five crossovers anyway. But so so there's a, there's, there's a challenge with coming up with dates. The other challenge is, is that a USPSA Nationals, unlike a level one or level two USPSA match put on by an affiliate, uh, generally comes with an expense that is much greater than the revenue attached to it. I hate to use the word lose money on nationals because it's one of the things we're here to do. But a national championship is often forty or fifty thousand dollars negative cash flow. I can survive that once or twice and still keep our budget happy and still keep our membership growing and still do all the things we need to do to support our affiliates. I cannot do that four or five times a year. So traditionally, we've outsourced some events. When we outsource an event, we lose control of the brand identity of the event. We lose control of what that event looks like on the ground. Uh, I'm finding that partners are harder and harder to come by who understand the overall direction we're taking the organization. So because of that, we decided that Perhaps it was time for a venue change for single stack, and the competitors have been telling me that since before I got this job. Uh, perhaps it was time for um, everyone to have an opportunity to shoot all of the matches uh, based on something other than geography. You, you get a lot of opinions, and you know, and nobody's shy. Everyone shares their opinion with me. So nine days of nationals, if you think back to last year, it was the first time we had done in optics and in irons, four divisions, four divisions, and Classic was still on its own. So we talked about this year doing the same format, uh, but integrating those Classic divisions in. Uh, and starting to look for dates was apparent that we were a little bit late to the dance again. So we came up with this nine days of nationals concept, which a lot of the membership loves. You don't usually hear from the people who love it, but a lot of membership, a lot of members like this. It gives them the ability to work one and shoot two. It solves an RO problem. It gives them the ability to work two and shoot one. It solves the RO problem. As it stands today, I have about one-third of my ROs who are just going to work, one-third of my ROs who are going to work and shoot, and, and, the, and the other third being split between whether they're ones and twos. But um, So it gives that opportunity. For the organization, uh, rather than having travel costs involved and getting all of those ROs to two or three locations, I now only have to get them to one location. For competitors, rather than to have to plan two entire weeks off to go to the Western United States or the, or the Eastern United States for matches, they're, st they're going to still take the same number of days off, but it's all going to be at once. So um, the, 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 the bad part of the schedule is, is that if you drew the card of being in a single stack and production match in Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, then you don't have the ability to simply make this a long weekend event like the... Uh, optics or the or, or the iron shooters do um obviously no matter what you do it's it's it's, it's going to come with some sort of a conflict for some people national championship is never going to be the kind of thing that's going to be convenient for 100 percent of the membership and i get that our membership have jobs and, and families and other obligations but this is the national championship and at its core it is a championship of people who aspire to be the best if it's a priority, they'll make it happen. And so I, I, will, I will quote my friend Scott Thompson from South Carolina. Uh, we were at Universal once, and he said, man, I hope you don't have this match here again next year. He said, I'll tell you what, if you have it here again next year, I'll be right here to complain about the same thing. And I thought that, that was the, the, the most uh, epic portrayal of the way it really is. And that is, I, I don't want to come back here, but if you have the Nationals here, I'll be here. And that's, that's not, that doesn't cause me to lose focus and that we need to, to, to move the Nationals around to different events. Um, the Steel Challenge World Speed Shooting Championship will be announced very soon, and it's going to be at a brand new facility that we've never had a national championship of any kind, uh, hoping to add more ranges to that. Um, developing ranges is not really um, 
our focus. Developing ranges where we can have a national championship is our focus. And we're not developing that with our own dollars. We're partnering with organizations who've already built stellar facilities. Because the 350 days a year that I don't need that real estate, um, it has to be mowed, taxes have to be paid, things like that have to, have to go on. The other, the other thing about the, the nine days of nationals is because we had a nine-day event, I was able to go to the Polk County Tourism Board. And we were actually able to get 40,000 tourism dollars to have three banquets at an indoor 40,000 square foot facility. I think 40,000. It's a big building, <laughs> even if it's 16,000 square feet, whatever it is. So the, uh, the, the tourism board um, was able to kick that in based on the number of people that I was going to bring into the area that we were going to have in those hotels. Our sponsors love it because now we have a new aggregate category. We have a new sponsor for the aggregate category for this for this one is Glock. Um, we have um, sponsors for each of the divisions. We have sponsors for each of the three events. Um, last year, we put two $100,000 plus prize tables together. Uh, this year, it will far exceed that. Uh, you add the aggregate in there where people who shoot all three matches will be able to get cash and firearms and awards. And we're really making this a mega sporting event. If you look at other, if you look at other disciplines, I had someone tell me recently that their nationals is a two-week commitment. And I can't remember what the, what the competition was, but it wasn't that much different than the, the, the drive that we have toward ours. Uh, shotgunners have always had a week-long uh, Championship, um, the uh, the folks who shoot um, muzzle loaders, mm -hmm. you know, uh, authentic reproduction rifles, they have a, a, an entire week of competition. A lot of the equestrian events are a week long. So we're not atypical from other sports in, in, in that. Um, so I understand there's challenges with nine days. It also gives us something else to talk about. If we change the format uh, and we have something to talk about, it gives us the ability to have a media platform to share for our sponsors. It gives us something for our members to use to promote themselves in their own shooting careers. And it gives us some buzz. You're asking me this question because I changed the format, not because we're having the same old nationals year in, year out. And so we like the fact that click data turns into money, turns into programs, turns into shooting, turns into money, turns into click data, turns into programs. We really like the way that that all works together. Uh, when I took this job two years ago, I came in and I said, we're no longer going to walk up to people and say, Mr. Sponsor, what will you give us for our match? We're not begging anymore. That's not the way that I do business. So we put together a value proposition. Jake Martin's our director of media and events has, in his second year of this particular program, doing very, very well with it, where we go to sponsors ahead of time, uh, and he sent this out end of November this year. Here's what 2018 looks like for us. Here are the opportunities that we have afforded to us, and they include social media shares, co-video productions, print magazine, online magazine, um, ev event sponsorship, and you tell us where on the menu that you'd like to plug in at what level. I will tell you that for each national championship, we had no less than five people fighting for the title sponsor. Not people that we were going to, reaching our hand out, asking him for anything, but people who were contacting us saying, what does it take to own this event? So because of that, we're seeing a shift in people who want to be engaged. And, and so here at the show, working with our industry partners, it's become apparent to me that we do have the value proposition and that we're not begging anymore. And that, that we are the model. IPSC is paying very close attention to what we're doing in that lane, too, because they have traditionally been the handout, what will you give us for this event? And we really need to think with, with the, the sponsors and with our media partners and everyone, what, what opportunity do you have to reach our members? We're going to have at least four demo areas at nationals this year where you can shoot CZs, where you can shoot SIGs, where you can shoot Glocks, where you can shoot Rugers. Um, there are um, going to be prizes associated with that. It's just a lot of buzz. And so it's a mega event. It's pretty heavy, but that's, that's the reason for it. You had mentioned when you were campaigning that you, you had interest in getting us bigger type sponsors, you know, non-traditional sponsors do you are you still thinking in those terms that this is the first step in that direction? While I am optimistic, I am very pragmatic in practice. 
And one of the things that we did just to gain sponsorship opportunity within our own lane, and this is the reason we have five deep for each opportunity, is we lowered the price of our sponsorships by almost half. It brought in a flood more money because people in the shooting sports tend to tend to be small sponsors. In my interaction with larger companies and in Ipsix interna- interaction with larger companies, uh, they tend to be very, very, very skittish of the firearms lane. Um, I've actually had sponsors say, under no circumstances will we ever do that. You should, it's, it, it, no matter what presentation you put in front of them that this is a sporting event, no matter how much you try to make them understand what we are, it's the gun that scares them. And if you look at the way companies are structured, they're often structured by people who are anti-gun at, at their own p- politics. You know, So would I ever turn that down, a mainstream sponsorship? No. Are we going to spend a tremendous amount of our energy running toward it when I have five other people willing to pay for each of those opportunities? Probably not. Do you consider USPSA a, a non-for-profit or a business? Well, let's, 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 let's give those different labels. Non-profit or not-for-profit uh, can even be split. Um, USPSA is a nonprofit. We're a 501c3 organization. Um, we are also a business, and what I heard over and over is run it like a business. That doesn't mean I have to run it like a business for profit, but it does mean that because we're a business, we have revenues and we have expenses. USPSA derives most of its revenue from activities, uh, with membership being a close second. Third are other businesses that we get into, advertising, um, sales contracts, uh, endorsements, those types of things. We pay tax on that income. So because we pay tax on that income, we actually, and, and other 501c3s are the same way, as long as that's not a majority of our activity, then it doesn't jeopardize our tax status. Tax status. So I think we're both. I think we're, we're a nonprofit that is run as a business that has some for-profit um, areas. The way that I keep that um, integrated without jeopardizing us is we use all of the money raised in those for-profit lanes to put back into shooting sports programs. Uh, there's a new program that we're going to have this year called NROI Academy. Uh, it's a concept that I pitched to Troy McManus, the director, last year. And NROI Academy, other than the traditional model where ROs, where people need RO training and you have to get 20 people together at a location and they have to pay about $800 to USPSA for for this training, which doesn't cover a third of the cost of actually providing the training. It just, um, it just commits that we're not going out to train three people. Okay, so that's the traditional model. The NRI Academy concept is that regionally in, say, Phoenix, Arizona, or Indianapolis, Indiana, or some large hub where we have interstates and airports and a large practical shooting presence in the community, we would put together a a four-day clinic where we would do the day-and-a-half RO class twice. We would do the one-day CRO class up to three or four times. Um, We've got some new modules for Steel Challenge that we're going to introduce, some new modules for Multigun that we're going to introduce, uh, and and some endorsements that ROs can get there so that they can somewhat be some specific in what they're working on. Um, so when you take all of those things and provide them uh, in a regional place paid for by the organization, and when I say paid for by the organization, we won't be asking for 20 people to get together and come up with $800. There may still be a small administrative fee, but the idea is to keep that as close to free as possible and to make it accessible. Luckily for me, someone contacted me late in the year last year about their annual charitable giving from their company. And this person wanted to make an impact. They said, where can we make the most impact? Is it juniors? Is it ROs? What can we do with the gift that we want to give you? Well, because we're 501c3 in Washington, because we are set up as a charity, we are a tax deduction for people's annual giving. No one's ever explored that before uh, that I can find in the history of the records that are available to me. So we met with this company. Uh, This individual's a practical shooter, and he's a friend of mine, and I can't disclose until we're finished with it who it is. But um, it's a a non-shooting related company. It's as mainstream as you get. In fact, it's, it's, it's an IT company that provides solutions for very large clients. And I met with him and I said, okay, so here is a concept that we've been talking about for a year in our Academy. 
And it's a place where you can make the most direct impact. And we can use your dollars to make these seminars happen at a lower cost to the members, giving you uh, recognition for doing so and also giving you a tax break. And they were all for it. So two things we've never done before. Put on RO classes ourselves without a commitment at a local level and have someone else pay for it. It's a lot like some of the uh, official corporate partners that we have. Uh, we're doing things with federal premium ammunition this year that have never been done before. Um, not only are they uh, sponsoring um, all nine days of the nationals and other events, uh, including filtering into some area matches and, and larger section matches, uh, they are also paying us a royalty on the ammunition. I don't know if you went by their booth and saw the USPSA logo on the, on the product box. Uh, there's going to be ammunition, and it's actually being produced and shipped to distributors and large box stores now. When you go to Cabela's, you can buy a federal Syntac action pistol at a competitive price that makes USPSA Power Factor. And we tested it in 13 guns at the Nationals. I tested it in six of my own guns. I provided chronograph data for all of that. We, we looked at their test data. It makes between 133 and 138 Power Factor in everything from a Glock 19 up to a Stock 2. So because of that, we're, um, uh, we're able to uh, capture some dollars off of a large ammunition company. Uh, they're also co-producing some videos with us that we're going to use for member education and RO education. One of the things that uh, we did for them is we actually put a video together with their production team to train the product engineers and the people who make the ammunition and why this ammunition has to absolutely be perfect because we measure our stages in tenths of a second. And sometimes we're less than a second between the champion and the next guy. So because of that, we're, um, we're able to turn opportunities into other opportunities. And so that's, that's, that's a lot of what we've been focusing our energy on. So with all this stuff going on, how do you find time to still practice? I, well, I haven't dry fired in a long time. I don't know how many of your uh, listeners are familiar with the band Cheap Trick, but Cheap Trick rehearsed three times in someone's garage in 1974 and went on the road, and they've been on the road performing ever since. Um, my shooting career is a lot like that. I practiced three times about 1999, went on the road shooting matches, and I've been on the road ever since. Um, I worked 360 days in 2016, and I worked probably 350 days in 2017, and I'm going to continue to work until we meet some of these objectives. Does that mean that I'll ever find time for practice? Who knows? But I'm getting a lot of practice, I guess, on the ground. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you at the beginning, is that you, know, you had your first year, and now you had what's going on now. I mean, where do you see things going in 2018? We're going to continue to work on the successful programs that we have. We're going to continue to cut out things that don't make sense and don't support our mission. Uh, we're going to continue to recruit uh, better employees, better volunteers. Uh, we're going to continue to work with our industry partners because that money affords us the ability to create a better organization. We're going to continue to grow members. We're going to continue to grow activities. Uh, we've got a really uh, awesome opportunity to partner with the folks at Practice Score to give them some money back for the things that they've been doing for practical shooting uh, and also for them to create some solutions that are actually even better than the ones that we already use today. Um, so those are the kinds of, kinds of things that we're working on. Thank you so much for uh, coming back one more year. Awesome. Thanks for having me.